In this video, I want to talk about a particularly powerful type of dynamic model, which is known as the error correction model. So the idea is that if I have my yt and xt, which are in general non-stationary, we spoke about one of the ways we can get around that, which is to regress first differences of yt on first differences in xt. So here I'm supposing that xt and yt might themselves be i1, which means that their first difference is stationary. But if it so happens that yt and xt are co-integrated, so that means that there is some sort of long run or equilibrium value of y, which is given by some linear combination of x, then it turns out we can do something which is much more powerful than just regressing first differences on one another. And because this relationship up here in the top right is essentially a, only a short run relationship. We'd like to try and include some sort of aspect of the long run relationship if, if we possibly could. So the idea here is that perhaps the y which we observe, yt, might be different from the equilibrium value. So there will be some sort of dependence not only on xt, but there perhaps will be some dependence on xt minus 1 because the idea here being that yt takes some time to react to changes in xt. And we also suppose that there is some sort of dependence on the lagged value of yt. Again, this could represent some sort of time it takes for y to adjust and the sort of mu here might represent some degree of inertia. And then finally, I'm just including an error term, vt. Okay, so this is a sort of model which an experimenter, a um, empirical investigator might come across in reality. But the problem with estimating this particular relationship is twofold. One of them is that it doesn't really tell us anything about the dynamics of xt and yt. It's just a whole range of lags of xt and yt so there's no real economic content which is something ideally which we'd like to have seeing as we're studying econometrics and we use that to study economic theory the second reason is a theoretical reason which is the fact that if y and x are themselves non-stationary we are very close to running into the problems of spurious regression so we know that if y is non-stationary and x is non-stationary, there is a high probability that if I run this type of regression, even if they're completely unrelated, there will be some statistically significant value of delta 1 which we obtain. So we'd like to be able to combat both of these things. We'd like to be able to estimate some sort of economic relationship and also we'd like to do away with this issue of spurious regression. And an error correction model is a way of doing this. And how we get to that particular model, I'm going to explain now. So the idea is that we start with this model here. And then to begin with, all we do is we take our yt and we take off yt minus 1. So the right hand side just stays the same. So I have c plus delta 1 times xt plus delta 2 times xt minus 1. And the only difference here, I'm going to put a minus here, 1 minus mu, because of the fact that I've just taken yt minus 1 from both sides. I did it to the left-hand side, so I have to do it to the right-hand side. Okay, so now this left-hand side here is just the change in yt, which is helpful because if y is i1, then the change in yt we know is going to be i0. In other words, it's going to be stationary. Okay, so that's good. But looking at this right-hand side here, we have still got these x and y, which are themselves non-stationary. So we have got part of the way, we haven't quite got all of the way yet. So the way in which we think about combating this is we would like to be dealing with first differences of x. So We've got up here delta 1 times xt. What I'm going to do down here is I'm going to take away delta 1 times xt minus 1. But I can't just do that arbitrarily. I have to add in here delta 1 times xt minus 1. 
And then I've still got my delta 2 times x t minus 1, uh, minus, sorry, 1 minus mu times y t minus 1 plus vt. Okay, which if I write it a bit neater, I have c plus delta 1 times the change in xt. And I'm actually going to write this whole second half slightly differently. I'm going to write it as minus lambda, which is a parameter I've just introduced. I'm going to explain it in a minute. Y t minus 1 minus alpha minus beta times x t minus 1 plus some error vt. And technically, I should actually change the constant here. So I'm, I'm getting a c prime rather than just c. So the idea here is that lambda is actually equal to 1 minus mu. You can see that quite quickly because essentially the only coefficient I've got on yt minus 1 is minus lambda. And minus lambda has got to be equal to minus 1 minus mu. So that's easy enough. The alpha and beta are slightly harder. I'm not going to show the alpha here, but the beta is, as it happens, just equal to delta 1 plus delta 2 all divided through by 1 minus mu. And to see that, you can just see here that in terms of the coefficients on x t minus 1, I've got a delta 1 plus delta 2. And then because I put this lambda outside, I've essentially got to divide through by lambda. And we know that lambda is just 1 minus mu. So that's how we've got this particular relationship. So why do we care about this particular relationship? And why is it useful to us? So remember that the left-hand side here is the change in yt. And if y is i1, we know that the change in yt is i0. And similarly, if xt is i1, the change in xt is itself i0. So these are both stationary, so that's, that's looking good. But what about this thing in the parenthesis here? Well, you can probably guess in the way in which I've written this in terms of defining these parameters alpha and beta, that essentially what I'm doing is I'm appealing to this long run relationship between y and x. And the idea is that if this long run relationship between y and x exists, then this particular term in the parenthesis here will be co-integrated. In other words, this term in the parenthesis here will be i0. So we've done away with our issue of spurious regression here. If it so happens that y and x are co-integrated, and we know the parameters of co-integration, alpha and beta. Frequently, we don't know those parameters alpha and beta, but I'm going to explain in the next video how we can actually estimate error correction models in circumstances where we don't know alpha and beta. Okay, so that's the sort of theoretical reason. What's the sort of economic reason for estimating these types of models? Well, the idea here is that imagine that yt minus 1 is above alpha plus beta times xt minus 1. Well, we know from this model up here that that's essentially the same as saying that y is above its equilibrium value. So if y is above its equilibrium value, then we take off a little bit of y. So the change in yt will be slightly negative. Hence, we correct the error in the last period to adjust further towards the equilibrium value of y. And this sort of error correction mechanism is why we call this an error correction model. So the idea is that this model allows for two types of things. If I just try and write in, if I try and get rid of this term here and have y change in yt here, well, it allows for both short run dynamics, which is given by this sort of half of the expression here. And it's short run because we're looking at first differences of yt regressed on first differences of xt. But it also allows long run dynamics into our model. Essentially, it allows there to be some sort of long run co-integrated relationship between yt and xt. So the idea here is that the parameter lambda actually tells us the speed at which our variable adjusts to any sort of disequilibrium. So the reason these models are, are highly favoured is because they allow for both interaction between short run and long run dynamics. So it's a lot richer than just regressing first differences here, which is just short run. 
or just regressing and doing a sort of leads and lags operator solely to get the long run relationship. 